It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning again, everyone. Now we continue our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things. And after we did thing number 11 on Monday, 100 Years of the Jersey Shore, today it's thing number 12, 100 Years of the Catskills. Next week, by the way, we'll get back to political ones during the Democratic Convention Week with 100 Years of Democratic Nominees on Monday and 100 Years of Democratic Convention Speech Moments next Wednesday, but today we stay on the summer vacation track for a 100 years of the Catskills, which more or less is going to be the rise and fall of the so-called Borscht Belt hotels, hotels that cater to a mostly New York City Jewish population and famously featured stand-up comedians like Henny Youngman. Two guys meet once, how's your children? They haven't got any children, so what do you do for aggravation? <laughs> The old man gets hit by a car. The cop pops him against the wall, covers him up with a blanket. He says, you're comfortable? He says, I make a nice living. We'll open the phone shortly, listeners, for your oral histories, your best memory of a line from a Catskill comedian or anything else. And with us now on 100 Years of the Catskills is Phil Brown, sociology and health science professor at Northeastern University in Boston, director of the Social Science Environmental Health Research Institute there, and author of books including Catskill Culture, A Mountain Rat's Memories of the Great Jewish Resort Area. I gather his family also owned one of the Catskill hotels, some of you may have known, called Brown's. Professor Brown, thanks a lot for giving us some time for this. Welcome to WNYC. My pleasure to be here. And I will ask you as we go about your family's personal experience with owning a Catskills hotel. But first, just to give listeners a more specific sense of place for this conversation, you note that when we say the Catskills in this context, we're really referring to a small section of the foothills of the Catskills, not even the heart of the mountain range. So where were the so-called Jewish Catskills, the so-called Borscht Belt, in their heyday? Well, that's exactly it. So it's the western part of Ulster County and a good part of Sullivan County. And a small tip uh, going up to Delaware County where the uh, German and Hungarian Jews were. But mainly we're talking about Sullivan and Ulster County. You've written that Jews began summering in the Catskills in the 1870s. Why there? Why then? Well, it was a little bit later than that. Um, Jews came up there because uh, they were first farmers, and uh, Baron de Hirsch brought up uh, people and taught them how to farm, and it wasn't a thing they could do very well, and the land wasn't great for farming except for eggs and for dairy. So they started to take in borders, and uh, around 1896, uh, Gerson's was the first place that we know of that became a regular Jewish resort area. And they found that they could make more money taking in boarders. And those boarding houses eventually grew. And sometimes Jews bought old hotels that were already in, in place and turned them into Jewish hotels. And they also started a wonderful thing called the bungalow colony. Lots of cottages where people had their own cottage for the whole year and cooked a uh, whole summer and cooked for themselves. This, of course, was during the large scale Jewish immigration from Europe in the Ellis Island era that this all got going, and you note that the massive immigration was met by anti-Semitic exclusion. Was that exclusion in the Catskills or from other kinds of vacation spots that drove New York Jews to the Catskills? Well, it was all over, but especially the Catskills were the closest uh, airy resort area that people could come to that seemed to have fresh air and pleasant uh, greenery and nice hills and a place to get away. But they came up there and they found signs that said no Hebrews allowed uh, or even Hebrews and dogs not allowed, similar mm -hmm. to what people found in Miami Beach in that era, despite the fact these would later become very Jewish places. And there were even Ku Klux Klan rallies in parts of Ulster County. Wow. So they had a lot to contend with. So having their own hotels where they could go um, have their own Jewish culture, their own Yiddish kite, their own cooking, their kosher cooking, uh, and to be part of their own community was important. Listeners, who has a Catskill Hotel memory you would like to share? Do some oral history here. We always invite your oral histories on these 100 Years of 100 Things segments, a story, a comment, or a question about the rise and fall or heyday of the so-called Borscht Belt, 212-433-WNYC, 212 
9692. Did your family vacation there in that context? Was anything about the experience formative or culturally significant for you? Do you have a Catskills coming of age story that you can share without violating FCC rules? Or questions for our guest, Phil Brown from Northeastern University and author of the book Catskill Culture, A Mountain Rat's Memories of the Great Jewish Resort Areas, 212 433. WNYC, 212-433-9692. Call or text with your oral histories and questions, or maybe a laugh line you remember from any Borscht Belt comedian, maybe Joan Rivers. I'll tell you, the way the styles are today, I'm glad I'm married, because if I was single, I could never get married looking like this, you know? And I feel sorry for any single girl today. The styles and the whole society is not for single girls, you know that. Single men, yes. A man, he's single, he's so lucky. A boy on a date, all he has to be is clean and able to pick up the check, he's a winner. You know that. <laughs> or a, a, man, a man can call up anybody in the whole world. You know that? Hello, I saw your name in the locker room. I thought I'd give you a quick call. <laughs> me. A girl, a girl can't call. Girl, you have to wait for the phone to ring, right? A young Joan Rivers. Harvey in White Plains, you're on WNYC. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I have a little story from uh, the Catskills, and I'm uh, just short of 83 years old. Uh, in my late teens, early 20s, I worked as a waiter in the dining rooms of Catskill hotels for about six summers. Uh, one summer, one hotel had a on the staff a Juilliard-trained singer. She was about 17 or 18 years old, who performed uh, that evening entertainments. Uh, she had room and board, and uh, I was privileged to serve her daily three meals uh, at one of my tables. I had three tables, each one about 12 people. Also, her mother, who was chaperoning her for the entire summer, um, we got to know each other very slowly, despite her omnipresent mother. And uh, today and this evening, we celebrate our 58th anniversary, Aww. August 14th, 1966. Happy anniversary, Harvey. That's a wonderful Thank story. You, and Phil, I'm sure many people met their girlfriends, boyfriends, future spouses uh, working as a waiter, as Harvey did, or being there as a vacationer in the Catskills. Exactly. And the flip side of what most people know as guests is what we knew as the staff. And, you know, we were certainly up there, uh, very happy to, to meet people. And for those of us, you know, who worked there, we often were older than we seemed uh, in that kind of milieu. So it was a very romantic atmosphere, uh, staff to staff and staff to guests, and many stories like Harvey's. You write that overcrowding on the Lower East Side played a big role in spurring Jewish travel to the Catskills early in that period. Can you describe that connection? Yes. Well, of course, people needed to get away, and they were not used to this because in the old country, they didn't have resorts to go to unless they were very wealthy. And it was a very foreign thing to them, but they heard about it. They heard about the boarding houses. Uh, the places up there advertised Yiddish ads in the several Yiddish newspapers at the time, and so it made it more comfortable. And indeed, you could go up there and speak entirely in Yiddish in lots of resorts, certainly in the, in the 20s, 30s, and even into the 50s and 60s, lots of people were sp still speaking Yiddish. So it was a place where people could go and kind of bring the Lower East Side with them, but get away. And get away, um, no matter how little money you made, there was a place that you could afford. And you mentioned uh, in that answer just now that in the old country, in Europe, only very wealthy people could go away to hotels or resorts, and you've written that Jews of all classes had places in the Catskills. Hotels, yes, but also the bungalow colonies, which you referenced before, and summer camps. I know my mother has described being a kid whose family of very modest means uh, sometimes took summer vacations at bungalow colonies where the mothers and children might stay a couple of weeks and the men would come up on the weekends from their jobs. So how would you describe bungalow colonies? It's not a term we really hear about lodging facilities today very much. Right. So the bungalow colony basically rented for the whole summer. 
And um, if we're talking about right after World War II, um, you know, three, four hundred dollars for a whole season. And even in the 1960s, uh, I've got contracts, you know, in my archives of the Catskills Institute that you could for eight hundred, nine hundred dollars get a bungalow for the entire season. So that was a wonderful place to go. And the men could continue to work in the city. And, you know, for people who've seen the film A Walk on the Moon with Diane Lane and Viggo Mortens, and this is a really great, uh, honest uh, look at what the bungalow colony life looked like. Uh, people had small places overcrowded with people there just to say we're overcrowded back in the city. But uh, they just walked out the door and there was a softball game. There was a tennis court. There was a pool or a pond. There was a Mahjong game. And people that you knew and could rely on to help take care of your kids if you had to run to the town for a doctor or to go shopping. So these were really wonderful little communities that lasted not just for that summer, but for many summers because people would return there. We talked about Jews being excluded from other places, driving the development of a Catskill Jewish hotel scene. And Jay and Yonkers wants to follow up on that with a specific, I think. Jay, you're on WNYC. Hello. Yes, I have in my possession a guidebook from the Delaware Hudson Railroad dated 1941, and it uh, lists all of the areas of the uh, Adirondacks, you know, going way up past even, you know, Saratoga, and almost every hotel and boarding house listing has printed restricted clientele. So Jews were not welcome there at all. So you're saying the exclusion of Jews from the Adirondacks may have contributed to a Jewish hotel belt yes. developing in the Catskills. Anything specific yes. to the Adirondacks that you have, Professor Brown? Um, well, we have some materials in our archives from places like Scroon Lake and the Adirondacks, and we have what we call the other Catskills, places like Moody's, Connecticut, uh, there are various little resort areas around New England and in New York that, you know, had some groupings of Jewish resorts, but nothing like uh, 600 hotels and maybe 700 bungalow colonies in the Catskills. So it was much, much bigger. And even if they didn't want to be as gross as to say restricted clientele or no Hebrews allowed, a lot of the ads in the guidebooks, and especially the Ontario and Western Railroads guidebooks, said churches nearby. And that was code for no Jews. Beverly and Nyack, you're on WNYC. Hi, Beverly. Hi, first time caller. I've listened to you for so long. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. Um, so we had a hotel right down the road from the, Bra the Browns in Lock Sheldrake. It was called the Hotel Gans, G-A-N-Z. And my great grandparents moved out of the Lower East Side I think around 1920 or something like that, and bought the hotel. Um, basically, it was, I think, established first for people who were sort of tuberculin or wanted to get away. And we had a big old main house with all these rocking chairs sitting outside, and people would just, you know, possess a rocking chair for the entire season. Some people did overwinter, but then it became just a summer thing. And after my great-grandparents died. My grandparents ran the hotel. And my mother and my aunt um, basically spent the whole summer there with us as kids. And they had both married drummers that they had met at the hotel who were working in the band. And as I was growing up, of course, I had a great time because all the boys who came to work for the summer were city college guys. Hmm. And we had a wonderful, wonderful growing up experience with an extended family from Hungary and Poland. Everybody we called aunt and uncle. They came back year after year after year. And it was just like a really warm and supportive way of growing up. So wait a minute. Do you two know each other? Uh, Phil, your family owned the Hotel Browns. Uh, Beverly well, says her two, family <laughs> owned a nearby hotel. There were two Browns hotels. So Charles and William Browns in Lock Sheldrake, one of the larger hotels, was not ours. Oh. My parents, William and Sylvia oh. Brown, owned Browns Hotel Royal in White Lake. And they probably had room for 50 guests at the most compared to probably 500 or 600 at Charles and William Browns. So no, we didn't know each other, but I worked 
in Lac Sheldrake at the Carmel Hotel for several seasons, and I know the area quite well. Thank you, Beverly. So how did your family get into the business, Professor Brown? Well, you know, they were always opening small businesses and not doing so great. And somehow in 1946, they had this idea that they would buy a little place uh, that was already operating called the Royal and try and make a go of it and borrow a little money from this relative and that relative and hope that some of the relatives would come up and work with them. They weren't very good at this. Uh, I was born uh, in 1949 during the period where they still owned it, uh, but not in the hotel because they were closed for the winter. Um, by 1952, they had um, the hotel foreclosed. They just couldn't meet the mortgage, and that was the end of it. So for the rest of their lives, they worked in other people's hotels. My mother is a chef, and my father running coffee shops or uh, being a chauffeur or a maitre d', various other jobs. So they spent their whole life until they died working in the Catskills. So you've written an extensive history of the whole scene, but how about for you personally? What was the best or most significant part of the Catskill Hotel experience for you personally? It was super exciting. Uh, even though we lived in parts of Florida during the winter that were largely Jewish, the Jewish culture up there was much more intense. Uh, I was able to be around uh, a lot of older people. I was able to hang around with the musicians, and they taught me a lot of music. I was able to work. I, my, I hoisted my first bus box in the main dining room at the age of 13, and by 15, I was a waiter. Uh, so it was very exciting, uh, and certainly the romantic part was important. And not to be forgotten, uh, coming from Florida, which was completely segregated, the mountains were not. I went to uh, to school up there with black students. I um, was in the staff quarters, sharing quarters and sharing uh, meals in the uh, staff dining room with people who were black and Latino, things that would never have happened down in Florida. So I learned a lot uh, about equality and justice up there as well. I also was able to make a lot of money and support yes, myself. Well, you could make a lot of money and support yourself. Uh, yes, yes. And I, you know, but in, in high school, I was very independent. I could buy my own car. I could buy my own clothes. And my parents, who were always short on money, um, you know, I didn't have to rely on them for all of that. So it was it was a growing up thing. It was you learned how to make do. You learned how to hustle. You learned how to make a little bit into a lot. So as as a waiter at a Borscht Belt Hotel, as a teenager, you made what I guess felt like a lot of money to a high school kid, right? Exactly. Uh, you just talked about it not being segregated, but we have a couple of people calling in to describe what they see as racism in that scene. Let's take one of those. Gus on the Upper West Side. You're on WNYC. Hi, Gus. Hello. Hi there. I uh, did a... Hi. Hi, Brian. I love your show. I've been listening forever. Thank you. Uh, about... 30 years ago, maybe more, I did a Frisbee demonstration in a clinic at Grossinger's. Had a wonderful time while I was there. My partner was a black man. And when we showed up in the dining room, a lot of eyes and voices and comments were made, actually sub rosa, but it was obvious that uh, he was an anomaly. And, uh, but we did have a good time. And I really loved it up there. How did he feel Not about that? Ex- How did he feel about well, that he, experience, if you know? He felt a little uncomfortable while we were there. He's a very dramatic-looking guy with a long ponytail and uh, uh, Puerto Rican and black. And he didn't. He felt a little out of place. But because we were kind of hired help, uh, we fit in. And we also had a special skill, which was, which we demonstrated for people. Back then, uh, professional level frisbee was pretty unusual as well. So yes. it was a double whammy. Gus, thank you very much. Anything in response to Gus, Professor Brown? Well, of course, you would find racism anywhere, uh, even in the most integrated schools or neighborhoods or institutions. So I don't deny that it was there. But I was listening to a radio show earlier today uh, by an author who wrote a book on Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, and Duke Ellington, and uh, about the kinds of discrimination they faced when they would uh, be playing in places where they had uh, segregated audiences or or simply all white audiences. 
Uh, that would never happen in the Catskills. If a black singer came, a black comedian, a, a, a black a vaudeville artist came to do their show and they got there at dinner time, they were walked right into the main dining room and they sat at the staff table with the band and the other entertainers and the, and the senior staff, like the head counselor uh, and the dance uh, team. So yes, uh, racism always exists, but the point is that you didn't shunt it off to the side. You didn't say you have to live in different quarters. You have to eat in a different place. And that to me was just quite mind opening and helped me to understand a lot at that time. If you're just joining us, listeners, we're in our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things. Today, it's thing number 12, 100 Years of the Catskills, meaning in this case, the Jewish Borscht Belt hotels, the rise and fall over about a 100-year period where uh, we haven't yet gotten to the fall, which we will, with our guest Phil Brown, who wrote the book Catskill Culture, A Mountain Rat's Memories of the Great Jewish Resort Area. And you were just talking about people playing in bands. David on Staten Island did that up there, I think. David, you're on WNYC. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You got a story for us? Uh, yes. In um, 1955, I was 20 years old. Uh, a group of us went up to the Borscht Belt to see if we can get a job as, get a job as a waiter or a busboy, more likely busboy, but we couldn't find any. So uh, I had been dating a girl um, who said she was going to work up in Ulster Heights as a counselor in a day camp in one of the hotels. So I said, let's go visit her. So we went to visit her. Uh, while we were sitting there, they fired the entire staff, and they said, you guys want a job as busboys? And wow. we said, yes. And so we, we took the job. It turned out there was a, um, a band there that played on weekends, and they also doubled as children's waiters or busboys. So um, I had my trumpet sent up from uh, the Bronx, where, where I lived, uh -huh. and I uh, joined the band. And the drummer was Walden Robert Casado, uh, who later became known as Bobby Darren. And so um, we got quite friendly. Um, uh, that was in 1955. Uh, I saw him several times during the winter, and we decided to form the band again the next year. And um, so we came up in 1956. And um, uh, at that point, I, I became a children's waiter instead of a busboy. Hmm. And again, we played on weekends. Bob was a very, very talented guy. I mean, he could do just about anything. Uh, he was an excellent comedian as well as a, as a, a terrific singer, and just a general uh, entertainer. So it was, it was quite a time. Um, the problem was that a couple of years later, uh, and that year I came up with my fiancé, and we subsequently got married, and um, um, a year or so later, Bob had become known as Bobby Darren, and he had... Um, he had uh, um, produced his first big hit, um, Splish Splash. I'm trying to remember the name. And um, uh, my wife and I were down in the village in one of the coffee shops, and uh, I saw Bob there with a with a kid, and he was telling this kid about the uh, the life of uh, of rock and roll. And so I said, uh, you know, Bob. Uh, we ought to get together sometime. And, and uh, he asked me what I had been doing. And I said, well, I just got a substitute license to teach science. Hmm. So he said, oh, let's be frank with each other, Dave. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Science? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So that was very <laughs> so distressing. He got very too big. distressing. What did you say Bobby Darren's real name yeah. was? Walden Robert Casado. I guess if your name is Walden Robert Casado and you want to make it in showbiz, you change it to Bobby Darren, huh? <laughs> David, thank you very much for that story. Uh, let's go right to another caller. So much oral history on the phones. Melissa in Ardsley, you're on WNYC. Hello. Hi. 
Um, thanks for taking my call. I am now 48 and grew up going with my family to cultures in the 80s, so very tail end. Um, and uh, it, it was so much part of my life. The movie Dirty Dancing came out. Um, I was 11. And I don't know if I saw it right then or on VHS, but it didn't occur to me that the family was Jewish. I had no idea that the family, like that, that was a part of the movie. Um, and I just on Facebook a couple of years ago said, Hey, so who noticed that they were Jewish? Um, and uh, it was a pretty 50, 50 of my friends who are a similar, um, Jewish, uh, background as I'm mm -hmm. We're like, Oh, that was something like we knew it was class, but oh, that, that was part of the story. Huh? You know, Interesting. Thank you very much, Melissa. Anything on that, Phil Brown? Well, it was interesting. So Dirty Dancing is the film that most people know about, and it's actually uh, what we would call de-Judaizing. Um, you could watch that and really, if you weren't Jewish, not know that this was a Jewish hotel with Jewish people. Uh, very different, for instance, the, than the film I mentioned about Bungo Colony Life, A Walk on the Moon, or uh, another film about small hotels, Sweet Lorraine, which is a really beautiful, beautiful film. Uh, some years ago at the Museum of Jewish History, I did a whole uh, show um, on the films of the Catskills, and I had all the filmmakers who had done those films and others come and talk about them, and we showed clips. But uh, Dirty Dancing, again, it's the thing that people know, it's very inauthentic. It doesn't really give the flavor that you would see if you watched A Walk on the Moon or Sweet Lorraine. We'll continue in a minute with Phil Brown from Northeastern University and author of a book on the history of the Jewish hotels in the Catskills uh, and more of your oral history calls. We've been getting so many calls about the heyday period here in our series, 100 Years of 100 Things, 100 Years of the Borscht Belt Catskill Hotels in today's segment, and we're going to get to the decline and why this theme, scene that was so thriving on so many levels, as we've been hearing people tell your stories about um, what happened to it. Among other things, keep calling us, keep texting us, 212-433-WNYC with your oral history moments as we continue on WNYC. <laughs> I live here in New York, on the west side. I live in an older building, a much older building. I live in a kind of building like if I want hot water, I gotta let it run a long time. Well, last week I took a bath on Sunday. I started the water on Friday. I'll tell you the one thing in my apartment in the winter, I always know how cold it is outside. I mean, whatever it is in my apartment, that's what it is outside. <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield on TV, but he had a reputation as a Catskills comedian. As we continue in our WNYC Centennial Series, 100 Years of 100 Things, it's thing number 12, 100 Years of the Catskills, meaning in this case the rise and fall of the so-called Borscht Belt Hotels with Catskills historian as well as an environmental health sciences professor at Northeastern University, Phil Brown, and your oral history stories or questions at 212 433 WNYC next week, by the way. It'll be 100 years of Democratic Convention items next Monday and Wednesday. You want, you want to talk about the entertainment scene and how that developed uh, with, I guess, singers in Act One, uh, comedians in Act Two? So a lot of the original idea for entertainment up there came from the Second Avenue Yiddish theaters and the vaudeville shows there and the takeoffs on Broadway shows. And a lot of those folks uh, needed new places to work, and this was a great opportunity for them. And you had talent bookers uh, like Aaron Toda coming, uh, bringing their people up all the time. And they realized that they could bring people up and they could do three shows a night. They could do uh, a big hotel, a small hotel, and then really late at night, a bungalow colony. Wow. And they could get this huge number of entertainers running around the whole mountains. And people loved it. You know, it was the kind of entertainment that they really wanted. Some places had their own entertainment on staff. And in fact, in our Caskills Institute archives, we've got a lot of those 
uh, brochures and, and playbills from places like Grossinger's and White Row Lake, where they did have their own entertainers. They did their own casting. They did their own music writing and uh, all the stage work, or the lighting and all of the costuming. So this was a place where people could come up and they could try out. Uh, and eventually it led them to other places. So if you did well in the Catskills, you could go to Vegas. It was a place also that was very hard on people because uh, they would boo you right off the stage. They weren't that polite. Wow. Uh, so you, singers and comics were typical. Um, every Friday night and Saturday night, even a small hotel would have one of each. And then during the rest of the week, there would be a film night. There would be a champagne night with dance contests run by the dance team. Uh, there would be a bingo night one night. And there would usually be a, a talent show that the staff and the guests would put on. So lots of different kinds of entertainment in the small hotels. The big hotels had comics and uh, singers all the time. Let me read from some of the texts that people are writing in with their stories. One writes, my family is Catholic, but living a block from the temple, most of our friends were Jewish. We would go to the Catskills for a weekend in the winter with the sisterhood of the synagogue. This was over 50 years ago. We were at least a dozen close friends in our early teens and had the run of the place. I remember getting the lifeguard at about 10 p.m. so he would open the pool and hang out with us. We had a blast. And the listener writes, I got my first kiss there, too, from a boy who remains a dear friend to this day. Speaking of lifeguards, another text. I was a lifeguard in one of the bungalow colonies for several years, 25 years ago. Some of my favorite memories were interactions with the old Hungarian Jewish residents golden bathing suits and all. They had great stories and were a wonderful window into our past and pre-war Europe. They were all survivors, a special breed of human beings. Another one, my Aunt Judy opened her own makeup business called Justine Cosmetics. For decades, she did very glamorous shows in all the hotels, the Concord, Grossinger's, Kutcher's. She was really very dramatic, and her customers ordered her makeup via mail for decades. She died last year, but was truly a legend, and I'm sure anyone who saw her show would never forget her. So many texts, as well as so many phone calls coming in. Uh, but to do a little bit more of the narrative timeline in this 100-year frame, Professor, you cite the 1950s, as the high point, and then the decline began in the 1970s. Why? Well, so right after World War II, you had uh, people, the economy was booming, they had more money to spend. Um, you had a lot of survivors coming over, needing a place to work, needing a place to stay, and sometimes feeling that they needed a place all of their own. In fact, there's a, another wonderful film called Four Seasons Lodge, which is a bungalow colony that is composed entirely of survivors because when they were at other colonies, they felt like they just couldn't share their experiences with other people. So that was a very important place for people to come in the 50s. And there was a huge growth you know, into the early 60s. There are so many reasons though for the decline. One of them was in fact intermarriage. Uh, if you say at the beginning of the 60s, how many Jews married other Jews? Mostly they did, maybe 90%. By the end of that decade, maybe half of Jews married other Jews. So this became maybe not as comfortable, even if you were a Catholic friend of Jews. Uh, it wasn't the same comfortable place. Uh, a lot of the um, people who wanted kosher food didn't care anymore, especially if their parents from the previous generation had died. Um, you also had staff mobility. The people who used to be the first generation working there to get through college to become professionals. Now, they were professionals, and they didn't need to go back and work there as waiters and busboys and musicians and lifeguards and counselors. Um, labor problems were another issue. Um, this was a, a very, uh, to be honest, exploitative system of labor. We worked seven days a week, uh, sometimes 10, 12 hours a day, or even more. And uh, especially the people who did the handyman work and the dishwashing work, uh, they, were, they were not paid very well and they were somewhat exploited. Um, it became much harder to get people to work in the hotels. And plus, a lot of them had not been modernized. So if you didn't have the money to modernize your hotel, you had very old crumbling places with shared mm. bathrooms. Mm. People did not want those shared bathrooms anymore. They did not want small rooms that were like eight by 10 that had two kids and two parents in it. And then a whole other thing was travel to other places. By this time, people would entertain the idea of going to Europe. Uh, if you're talking about like 10 years after the end of the Holocaust, 
people weren't going to go back to Europe, but right. in the sixties, their kids in college were going there and Europe now seemed safer. And then there were, of course, the Caribbean cruises as well, which by the way, got their idea of the all inclusive vacation from the Catskills where you mm. paid one daily or weekly rate and you got all of your meals and everything else, all your entertainment, as well as your room and board. So now that people could travel elsewhere, they were much less likely to want to go to the Catskills. So we've been talking about primarily people from New York City who would go up there to vacation or to work. Elise in Brooklyn is calling in as someone who grew up in the area, uh, living there full, you know, living there um, year round. Elise, you're on WNYC. Hello. Hi. So I was born in Brooklyn, raised in the Catskills, went to elementary and uh, junior, senior high school in Fallsburg, my town, Hurleyville, next town, three callers ago or so. Um, I'd love to get in touch with her because her last name is Gans, and I think we could be related through my um, aunt, through marriage. So I uh, spent my adult life in Brooklyn. My family first came to that area uh, in 1920. My grandmother had a bungalow in Hurleyville. So I lived through that arc of the kind of tail end of the high and through the decline and um, moved to Brooklyn as a young adult in my early 20s after some time in New England. So now I live there about half time in the house I grew up in. So I've seen the whole thing. But I want to go back a little bit to what your caller said about education and race up there, because I spent my career in New York City as an educator mm -hmm. and I've studied race and education quite a bit. And I, even as a child, found the schools up there to be quite racist, though they were on paper integrated. And there was the use of tracking with the uh, goal of getting upper middle class, primarily white and Jewish kids, into college and something called a general track, which would prepare people basically for manual work. And that's, those are the schools that I remember. More of that and up I there than it. in the city, in your experience. Well, what? I don't think that's actually true. I think it pretty much was at that time the same with yeah. uh, IGC and SP. I think, you know, the way race is, is uh, used, as, as Isabel Wilkerson would say, cast, is yep. education preserves that, those boundaries. But it wasn't a land of opportunity for people of color. Briefly, and as the hotel closed, mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. became far more desperate for those people, and many of them had to leave because there was literally nothing for them to do. What was it like for you as a kid being what the vacationers may have called a townie? Uh, well, not dissimilar to now. The summer was actually kind of difficult because it became intensely crowded. We still, and now more so than ever, suffer with lack of resources and infrastructure for what's explosive growth because the Catskills is back to full tilt, only now instead of secular Jews, we have mostly have, our visitors are mostly uh, very observant Orthodox Jews. And the infrastructure of the town, both power and water, is inadequate for what we have in summer visitors. Um, being a town person, you know, I would look at it two ways. I think probably by the time I was a young teenager, I understood that this provided our economy. And only maybe through summer camp experiences, or uh, did I, I probably would say exactly only through summer camp experiences did I mm -hmm. ever interact with any summer people. And, and Elise, I have to leave it there because the show's about to end, but thank you for all the aspects of your call. And so as a last thought from you, Professor Brown, I mean, we could do another whole show from your other specialty as an environmental health scientist on, you know, the environment of the Catskills and clean water and air and everything else and is or isn't, but is what Elise suggests true that the economy of that area has come back, but more for Orthodox Jews than the secular Jews of the decades in the earlier part of the century? We have 30 seconds. That is generally true. Um, and some of the small businesses that were there supplying, you know, plumbing, electricity, uh, and wholesale groceries are still in operation, but mainly not. Um, it, it's a very different economy because you don't have a half a million people going up there every year to vacation. 
Uh, given the few seconds left, I would say if you really want to learn more about this, visit our website at the Catskills Institute, and you'll see all of the wonderful history there, stories, music, and uh, full of things that people like you, the listeners and callers in, have sent us. So do send us stuff right. because it'll be part of our archives for students and uh, perusers forever. Bill Brown from Northeastern University and author of the book, Catskill Culture and from the Catskills Institute. Thank you so much for this. My pleasure.